This is Wild Chronicles. I'm Boyd Matson. Whooping cranes are the tallest birds native to North America and some of the most endangered. In 1955, there were fewer than two dozen of these elegant avian giants left. Now, after years of careful conservation, there are about 500. I'm in Wisconsin's Nacido National Wildlife Refuge with Joe Duff, co-founder of the conservation group Operation Migration. Here, a small group of whooping crane chicks are learning to fly behind an ultralight aircraft called a trike. It's a skill they'll need for their annual migration, a 1,200-mile trek from Wisconsin to Florida. This year, I've been invited to fly along on one of their training missions. It's the very first time that a journalist has been allowed to fly with the cranes. And if I'm going to fly with them, I've got to dress the part. So Joe, these look nothing like a bird. It's, it's designed to disguise the human form so that, so that once the birds are released and they encounter a normally dressed human, there's nothing they're familiar with and they'll be afraid of it. The main thing is to keep them from thinking that humans are something they want to be around. That's right. It, it looks a lot like a whooping crane head. They've been fed and, and taught to uh, forage using this thing from the time they were just chicks, and they're attracted to it. You know, our, our headgear is white, so they, they don't pay attention to our head, they pay attention to this head. So who knows how they reason that out, but it works, it works well. The costumes even come equipped with sound effects. This is a brood collar or a crane purr, and it's you know, it, it kind of says to the chick, you know, you're okay, everything's fine, I'm here. And it's calming, and they've heard this from the time they were, before they were hatched, actually. So. Okay, well, let's it's see right. how you interact with the cranes. doesn't look ridiculous, you say? If they're, if they're birds if here? If there are birds around, not quite so ridiculous. <laughs> and birds actually think this is going to get you off the ground. That's right. <laughs> you may have to make my strap bigger. Really, I feel like we should go trick-or-treating. <laughs> you might think birds know instinctively where to migrate, but they actually learn the route from their parents. And that's a problem for these whooping crane chicks. They were bred in captivity and raised by researchers. Without older wild birds to show them the way, they had no idea where to go when winter comes. That's where Operation Migration comes in. Migration route may have evolved over, who knows, a million years. And it's passed from one generation to the next, but it only exists in the minds of the birds that are using it. Once they're gone, that route disappears. There's no signposts, nothing. Each year since 2001, Joe and his team have shown captive bred whooping cranes where to migrate by leading the way themselves. They use a tiny ultralight aircraft called a trike and train the birds to follow it. So how do you get them to fly with them? As soon as they pip, as soon as they punch a hole in the egg, we start playing a recording of the aircraft engine. When they're a few days old, we actually park the aircraft outside the pen and fire it up and let them get used to it. When they're two weeks old, we introduce them uh, to the aircraft outside in training. So it's just a matter of conditioning over the period of time and they get used to it. It just takes one guided trip down to Florida for the birds to learn the route. In the spring, they fly back to Nasita on their own. So far, Operation Migration and its partners have established a population of about 60 whooping cranes in Wisconsin a place where they had been extinct for nearly 100 years. But it hasn't been easy. Each chick represents a huge investment. Every bird we have is about $100,000 worth of effort and time and, and money from donors. And if we lose one, it's, it's tragic. Early the next morning, we meet at the airport. It's 
perfect weather for a flight, and I put on my crane costume before takeoff. The view from above is breathtaking. Well, the birds will be training are right kind of where our shadow is. Soon, Joe appears with a group of cranes in tow. Up high to your right, Joe. He leads the birds on a series of long loops over the misty wetlands. With each pass, the birds appear to become more cohesive, establishing a pecking order and learning to use air currents from the plane's wings to make flying easier. After nearly 20 minutes of flight training, it's time to return the birds to their pens. But first, a few curious cranes stop by to check out the ultralight and its unfamiliar passenger. To prevent the birds from imprinting on human voices, there's no talking allowed. The only sounds come from the cranes and the handler's vocalizers. With a bit of coaxing, eventually all the cranes are herded into their pens. According to Joe, the birds are nearly ready for the migration. In early October, they begin the two-month-long journey south to Florida. Next year, Joe and his team will be back, do it all over again. And they will continue to come back until these glorious birds are out of danger. I just think once you've committed to this, you have an obligation to see it through. They're an endangered species, and it's because of us. And now modern technology has the opportunity to try to put that back, and I think we have an obligation to do that.